one of your greatest contributions has been that you've really put APOB, the, the, the marker APOB on the, at the forefront of the CBD conversation. So if there's one takeaway from this show and there will be many for you, get, know what your APOB is. You know, you can, there's a lot to look at there, but APOB, APOB, and, and that, that is a powerful one. And, and thank you for that. And my question there on a personal level, and I think everyone's going to want to know this is okay. I, I can find out what my APOB is. Let's talk about how you view healthy levels of APOB and, and your goals for APOB. And fundamentally, how do we get there? Well, uh, I'll defer to you, Jason, but do, should, should I assume that the listener knows what APOB is? I, I would do a brief synopsis. We've talked about it quite a bit, but for, there are probably people new on here. So maybe a brief primer on what it is. So APOB is a, is a protein that is wrapped around uh, lipoproteins, but particularly a class of lipoproteins that are harmful, that are what we call atherogenic, meaning that they promote atherosclerosis. So the most prevalent of these is the LDL or the low density lipoprotein, but they're also found on very low density lipoproteins, intermediate density lipoproteins and LP little a particles, which we should maybe talk about another time. So basically any particle that has the potential to carry cholesterol <clears throat> into your artery wall, leave it there, get an, you know, become oxidized and create the inflammatory response that leads to this number one killer. That's the thing we want to understand. And while most people, when they go to the doctor, have their LDL cholesterol measured, that's the number LDLC, that's just telling you how much cholesterol is contained within the LDL particles. And while that's a decent predictor of cardiovascular risk, it's nowhere near as good as measuring the concentration or counting basically the number of all of those particles. And that's what APOB is measuring because of the very beautiful fact that each atherogenic particle has one and only one APOB on its surface. So by measuring the concentration of APOB, you have a direct measurement of the concentration of atherogenic particles. So with that said, there are basically four things that are driving atherosclerosis. Smoking, high blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance, and uh, you know hyperinsulinemia, elevated levels of glucose, all the things that cluster around metabolic disease and ApoB. Now what's interesting about ApoB <clears throat> is that it is a necessary but not sufficient criteria for atherosclerosis. What that means is you can't get atherosclerosis without ApoB. So the implication of this is actually profound. The implication of this is if you want to eradicate atherosclerosis, all you would have to do is eradicate ApoB. Now, of course, you'd have to do that early enough in life because it's a time exposure. You, you pointed out the example I write about in the book of a 24 or 26 year old who's the victim of a homicide. So he dies of a very clear cause of death, but on autopsy, his coronary arteries already demonstrate quite advanced atherosclerosis. That is not an uncommon finding. That's a finding that has been reproduced over and over on autopsy studies. So, what we know is that when children are born, their ApoB is very low. It's typically on the order of 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. However, by the time you're in your 20s and certainly in your 30s, the average person's ApoB is about 100 to maybe 110 milligrams per deciliter. And that's already very high from the standpoint of prevention. In fact, only 20% of adults would have an ApoB below 80 milligrams per deciliter. Now, no one knows what the exact number is, but certainly Peter Libby, who I would consider the foremost authority on this at Harvard, has argued that if ApoB is in the range of 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter, i.e. what's referred to as physiologic levels, the level that children have, atherosclerosis would be impossible. And so the question then becomes, how could one get their ApoB that low? And outside of perhaps the most draconian dietary, you know, modifications that would not be sustainable, right? So, you know, just living on lettuce and celery, for example, 
Um, it basically would require pharmacotherapy to get your ApoB that low. So there's obviously great heterogeneity genetically. Um, and absolutely, uh, nutrition makes a difference. The two most important ways it does is by reducing triglycerides and probably reducing saturated fat intake. Uh, but, but even once those things are fully optimized, very few people would be able to get their ApoB below say 70 milligrams per deciliter with those things being fully optimized as adults. This gets particularly more difficult in women when they go through menopause because the reduction of estrogen further complicates this. And so women will typically see a significant bump in their ApoB as they transition through menopause. And this explains two things. One, pre-menopause women have some protection from cardiovascular disease that some of which might be mitigated or mediated through estrogen. And secondly, eventually women kind of catch up in terms of heart disease once they lose the protection of estrogen, which of course isn't complete protection, but sort of partial protection.